So we are all on a journey of unfoldment, of self-realization. We're all on a journey of the discovery of the truth about ourselves. And that truth is that we are all love in expression. And I build, bring you now one who is truly that expression of love, our Reverend John will address us this morning. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Good morning, friends. Good morning. I just had an aha um, reading the responsive reading, and I got an affirmation, which will be your first assignment. I put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let's say that this week as we are getting dressed for work or school or whatever our daily endeavors are. It's on your responsive reading on page four. So take it home, and as you're putting on something gorgeous this week, say, let us say it together. I put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So I welcome you, add my own words of welcome, and to those who join us on the internet as well. I'm so excited. We have spent an hour and a half, Maya Johnson and I, doing Facebook, and um, I'm not yet tweeting or tweeting or whatever it is, but I'll, <laughs> I'll soon be there as well. So this is wonderful. So we're into, into Love Month, aren't we? The first Sunday of the month dedicated to the celebration of love. But you know, I know that you agree with me that love shouldn't be a one-day event. You agree with me? Yes. And as Reverend Freddie said, it should be a journey, a joyous journey. So I have titled my encouragement, which is what I call my talks, The Way of Love. I'm one of those fortunate people who grew up surrounded by expressions of love. In fact, I used to feel a little envious when I used to watch Oprah and everybody was, you know, saying all of the hardships they had had growing up and problems with their parents. And I would say, I had such a normal childhood, I don't have a soul to blame. <laughs> but it had its disadvantages. My mother, Daisy, and my dad, who was a little fellow, who we called Big John, constantly demonstrated the way of love. Sometimes much to the dismay of my brother Dennis and me, who really wished they wouldn't be quite so demonstrative and overt in their expressions of affection in front of our friends. You know, young people don't believe their parents do it. So, you know, we think, we think, you know, they did it twice if there are two children, thrice if there are three children, you know. But my parents were just so expressive of love, so they held hands under the dinner table and smooched out every, and you know, when you have friends, you're thinking, oh my God, no, don't do this to me. I also was puzzled as a child as to why the ways of love were so contradictory. For example, for Valentine's Day in 1947, my mother gave my father what I thought was a huge tome of poetry called Best Loved Poems of the American People. It seemed huge to me because Daddy insisted every night at bedtime of reading one or two or three or maybe five poems as bedtime reading to my brother Dennis and I. Mommy gave him on Valentine's Day, 1947, and then constantly complained that he buried himself in poetry every waking moment. <laughs> and I still have the book. I still remember Dad sitting on the veranda on a Sunday morning after church, puffing on his pipe and reading from his Valentine's book. My mom, duster in hand, breezes past him as she puts our immaculate home in further order. She pauses long enough to offer him another cup of coffee and then says, sweetheart, don't get up now. That always means not now, but in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> but when you have time, he's reading on the veranda, you know, would, would you please fix that dripping faucet in the laundry? Dad leaps to his feet, fetches the tool pan from the garage and goes to do her bidding. Half an hour later, the best love poems of the American people are back on his lap and his pipe is relit. 
mom reappears. And perching on the arm of his chair, coos, love me. And we all danced to myself, always knew that meant another demand was coming. <laughs> he says, mm hmm. She says, I'm doing your favorite for lunch roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. He goes, mm hmm. Not taking his eyes out of the book. Mom, who was never deterred by our preoccupation with other matters, asked sweetly, Darling, do you want to plant the three rose plants you and the boys bought me for Valentine's Day in the front garden or around the side where it's a bit shadier? Without waiting for an answer, she pecks him on the forehead and disappears back into the house. Now I want to ask you, what do you suppose my dad did? Did he keep reading for another hour? Ah, 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 him know which side for him bread but upon. So he sets aside his best love book and gets up once again and goes to the guard for the garden folk, muttering half to himself and half to me, a thing of beauty is a job forever. <laughs> That's a deliberate misquote of the opening line of Endymion, the beautiful poem by John Keats. For what Keats actually said was, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. But dad never let on whether the thing of beauty to which he referred was the garden or my mother. <laughs> him didn't know which side for him bread, but upon. He was after all, though, an expert at building and maintaining relationships. But I have come to learn that when walks the way of love, my friends, the, a thing of beauty is both a joy uh, hey, hey and a job. And that includes the fragile beauty and trust of your friendships with other people. You know, sometimes, and the closer you are, the more deeply you can be hurt. I don't think people wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to hurt my best friend today. But in being human, in expressing, in our rushing around on the pathway of love, sometimes we do really hurtful things or we say really hurtful things. So we have to work at maintaining friendship, don't we? I remember well those early lessons in friendship. My brother Dennis, a precocious eight-year-old, would ask my father, why is it he jumped up to do mom's bidding? Can't she just wait until you've finished your book? You know, she does the same thing with me. You know, she never allows me to finish reading anything, you know. Dad smiles and says, you know, I've noticed, son, that when your friends next door call you, you drop everything you're doing and rush to the fence. Well, mom is my friend. Lesson one in friendship. So I believe that if we really want to love others with deeper feeling each passing day, if we want to love more fully, if we want our relationships to be more meaningful, in short, if we want to walk the way of love, then it does require work on our part. It can't happen just by chance. Things of beauty always require our best endeavors in creating and maintaining them. And that applies no less to friendships as it does to your home and even to great works of art. Speaking of great works of art, the first year I came here was 1981, and my dad gave this card to my mother. He had a, 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 a cartoonist draw a heart rolled over on its side on a little caricature of, of himself on top of the heart. And it says inside, my heart runneth over. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Embarrassing. <laughs> the founder of our great teaching, Dr. Ernest Holmes said, and I quote, love is the self-givingness of the spirit through the desire of life to express itself in terms of creation. And that, my dear young people, doesn't only mean making whoopee, <laughs> although that's part of it too. So, Holmes said too that love is a cosmic force. Just listen to this. Love is a cosmic force whose sweep is irresistible. Wow. What he was saying is that love is the greatest power in the universe the one creative force behind everything that exists. 
No wonder Jesus taught love as the two greatest commandments. In Mark 12, 29 to 31, the master says, and I quote, the first is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, help me, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, what? Love your neighbor as, as yourself. Wow, <laughs> the two greatest commandments. You know, when I first visited this temple 33 years ago and sat right there in the back where I see Jennifer sitting now with my friend Larry Chang, listening to truth pouring effortlessly from Reverend Elmer's, uh, Dr. Elmer Lomzen's lips, the predominant feeling that I experienced on my first visit here was that love. And it was palpable. The responsive reading that Sunday was taken from 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Well, you know, Reverend Elmer was no sounding brass. And love shone forth from her and seemed to radiate from the very walls of this temple. It was absolutely wonderful. So Larry and I used to have this little, this little joke at each other's expense. We used to tease each other that he would feel, that he would think a feel while I would feel a think. <laughs> Which meant, you know, that he usually responded to everything from his headspace. He was very cerebral and, and brilliant, you know, and I would respond to everything from my heart, you know. So on a Sunday morning, or oh, won't was, we would sit and have coffee, me coffee, he tea, and we would discuss the affairs of the world and heal everything that needed healing, we thought. And so that first Sunday when I visited, we went back to his house and I was having coffee and he said, what did you think of the message? And I said, it felt wonderful. He said, I, 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 I never asked you what you felt. I asked you what you think. I said, well, I think it felt wonderful. <laughs> I was come from here. At that time, I had just gone through a painful severance with a company of which I had been a founding member, and I was still in litigation with them for more money and burning with anger. I needed to learn the way of love, and I think that, that God led me to this teaching for that. And that morning, I remember Reverend Elmer saying, you know, when you're in a, in a what we call in Jamaica, a preke, which means, you know, an upset and a, a mix-up of emotional feelings, she said, do you want to be healed? Or do you want to be justified there? Because if you want to be healed, there is one path that you go down, the path of love. And if you want to be justified, then you know you prove that you are right. And you have to have the last word and the last say. And you know, then you tell everybody in, that, that will listen. The horrible story of what him do me, or what she did me. You know, after I put that boy through school, you know, and then him turn around, you know the story. Do you want to be healed? and to feel the peace and the love and the balm of, of living in close contact with the author of love? Or do you want to be justified so people will say, yes, you are right. You can choose. But that Sunday when I was here, it was as though someone had given me a cool glass of water and it literally just cooled my anger. It slaked my thirst. And I understood what the master meant in John 4, 14 when he said to the woman of Samaria at the well, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. You know, every time you take a sip of water this week, just think of that. When you drink of the water of love, the elixir of love's way, you can't thirst again. And you can offer that chalice of your love and your appreciation and your praise to everyone whom you meet upon the path. It's easy to do it with your friends and your family and your combalo, as we say in Jamaica, those people with whom you're really close and intimate. But the challenge is when you meet someone who your spirit, uh, mm -mm. keep your pro program this morning because their responsive reading says, let me find it. When you see something in another person you don't like, the light is shining from your own soul and consciousness and heart. So this week, 
I want you to remember that. So we have several assignments. Wow, the first is when you're getting dressed in the morning, put on love. I love that. And then the second one is every time you take a sip of water, just think, I'm sipping from the fountain of love. And think about who is your woman at your well? Because all of us have somebody that we need to be reconciled with and to see love in. And remember, Jesus never condemned her. You know, he just said, I know you're not married to the man you're there with now, but drink this water here. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the water of love, and it heals everything. And so I realized that although from childhood I had learned to express love in familiar and everyday exchanges of affection with family and close friends, I had only begun the journey on love's infinite path. It was as though God was telling me that my life, my hopes, my dreams, my aspirations must be fulfilled through a higher selfless love. And I didn't know it at the time, but I wondered if that was when I felt the first stirrings of that, that tiny whisper to ministry. You know, come, just come. There's a way, a way of love, and I'm choosing you. I didn't know it at the time, and if I was hearing it, I said, don't send me, send me Lord, but send her first, you know. Um, but I think it happened. And that, so that evening of that first Sunday in 1981 when I came here, I reread 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, regulars at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living know that I'm big on assignments. Huh? You've got two already. You're going to get two more. I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 every morning on awakening this week. Because <laughs> love centered in self alone, appropriated only for our own satisfaction without including the highest good of others, leaves you alone and isolated from life. And you feel like it's you won or walk the path. Someone wise once said, Practice makes permanent. <laughs> so as we become more practiced in expressing love, we become less possessive and more magnanimous in spirit. Read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 every day, and you will find that you more easily harmonize with your world of form, your world of finance, and your world of relationships. you more easily choose to walk the way of love. Let's just say together, I choose to walk the way of love. Can we say that? I choose to walk the way of love. Love is the heart of my way and the way of my heart. Put your hand on your heart and say it. Love is the heart of my way and the way of my heart. And then I'm not going to be here, I'm going to be here in spirit on Friendship Sunday, which is Sunday the 16th. Please bring everybody you know with you. I'm going to be representing you all at the Centers of Spiritual Living WOW Conference in Orlando. But since I'm not going to be here, I want to give you one for that too. Evie? <laughs> yep. You need not be so concerned, you know, with finding who is at fault in your in harmonious relationships. You just need to heal them. We in Science of Mind know that we demonstrate everything in our lives. So if you have a relationship that's not running smoothly, it has a few kinks in it, you have really brought it into being in order for you to learn something from it. And you can learn some very powerful lessons. So this assignment is related to that matter. Very simple assignment, these you're getting though, no big thing. The biggest one I think is having to read the first, the, uh, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. This week, whenever you're faced with trying experiences or human mistakes, or whenever you begin to feel irked by other people, just pause for a moment and ask yourself, what would love do now? How would love respond? If I was totally love, pure love, if I was at the well, like the woman of Samaria, what is, would I fill the cup with that I'm offering other people to drink? Would I fill it with poison and, and, and hatred and harsh words and bitter criticism? Or would I fill it with the elixir of pure love? 
Holmes said, love points the way and the law makes the way possible. So when you decide to love, they just are, the whole universe just moves to support you in wonderful and expressive and beautiful ways. Now friends, there are many ways and many paths to spiritual fulfillment. And some of these paths may appear to be detours and some may even turn out to be far off course. But the science of mind declaration of principles affirms the truth that the goal is sure to be attained by all. Isn't that wonderful? No matter what we have done, no matter what our past is, no matter the paths that we have chosen, the goal of unification with the source of all love from which you never departed. For love always has held you close to its everlasting heart. God has always loved you with an everlasting love. But like the prodigal, sometimes we wander away, don't we? And find ourselves in a far country. And when we come to our senses and realize the love that is there waiting to fill our lives and our relationships and our very beingness, the love that is, is the essence of our being, then we know that we can turn back to the father, mother, from which all love comes. And where was the prodigal's father when he turned back? He was at home, waiting, waiting with open arms and open heart to receive that which he created out of himself and that which he loves and continues to love. And so on this first Sunday of the Love Month, I wanted to share with you a poem by a man called Roy Croft titled Love from the Valentine's gift my mom gave my dad in 1947. I love you, not only for what you are, but for what I am when I am with you. I love you not only for what you have made of yourself, but for what you are making of me. I love you for the part of me that you bring out. I love you for putting your hand into my heaped up heart and passing over all the foolish weak things that you can't help dimly seeing there and for drawing out into the light all the beautiful belongings that no one else had looked quite far enough to find. I love you because you are helping to make of the, of the lumber of my life not a tavern, but a temple. Out of the works of my everyday, not a reproach, but a song. I love you because you have done more than any creed could have done to make me good and more than any fate could have done to make me happy. You have done it without a touch, without a word, without a sign. You have done it by being yourself. Perhaps that what, perhaps that is what being a friend means after all. And now abide, friends. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these. Can we say that together? And now abide, faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Namaste.